Most people do not like the idea of going to court. However simple the dispute may be, it's not something you're going to look forward to. You'll probably feel slightly anxious about it. And understandably, you probably don't have any idea as to how the court process works once you actually get to court. So I thought it might be quite useful to run through the procedure for a simple small claim and more importantly, how you can go about putting your case to the court as best you can. And that is what I'm talking about today. But if you're new to me, I'm a barrister who helps you understand law on this channel. So please hit the subscribe button so you don't miss anything. I do live streams once a week and I also answer additional questions over on my sister channel, Black Belt Secrets, linked below. I've released more than 160 videos at the time of recording, so I'm sure there's going to be something in my library that you might find useful. So taking a small claim as an example, it will be heard in the county court. A lot of people think of this as the small claims court, but it is actually the county court that hears a small claim. The main differences between a small claim and any other kind of claim are twofold. First of all, it's designed to be a slightly simpler procedure and is heard in less time than other claims, usually a couple of hours or so. The second main difference with small claims is that you are not usually at risk to legal costs, that is lawyer's fees, aside from the fixed costs of issuing the claim and the hearing fee. But I go into more detail about these in other videos. And today I'm going to talk about the procedure of a small claim and how to best put your case across. So typically at a small claim, you would usually have around two witnesses per side, i.e. the claimant and the defendant. If you are bringing the claim against another person or a company, you are the claimant and they are the defendant. And usually you would have no more than two witnesses for each side because of the amount of time it would take for those witnesses to give evidence. The small claim is likely to be heard by a single district judge or deputy district judge. It is possible that it could be heard by a circuit judge, which is more senior, but that's very unlikely for a small claim. So at the beginning of the hearing, the judge is going to check who is present in the courtroom, or more recently with the pandemic, perhaps on Microsoft Teams or Zoom or something similar. The judge will check who is there to represent the claimant, who is there to represent the defendant and any witnesses that are giving evidence for each side. The witnesses don't necessarily need to be the claimant or the defendant, just giving evidence for either party. Once the judge is satisfied who is present for the hearing, the judge is going to open the case. This is a formal opening of the case for the court record as to what the claim is about, who it is brought by and who it is brought against. The judge will ordinarily confirm what papers have been received, what papers have been read and whether the procedures, even though they are somewhat simplified for the small claims track, have been complied with and that the claim is ready to be heard on that day. The judge will also often make some comments as to what he or she thinks about the case at this very outset and what the main issue of the case would be. This helps to narrow down what we call the issues or the disputes between the parties which are left to be decided by the court because you should think of court as a third party intermediary to decide a dispute between parties that cannot agree. The claimant or claimant's representative will provide a summary of their position, why the claim has been brought and why the court should find in their favor. These are called the opening arguments or opening statement. And you can still take a barrister to a small claims hearing or you can do it yourself if you are confident to do so. It's possible that the judge may ask questions of the claimant or their representative during this opening statement. This might be to clarify any facts or the nature of the dispute or what we call the quantum or the amount of money in dispute. Once the claim has been opened in this way, the judge will invite the claimant to call their first witness. This may very well be one single witness and the same person bringing the claim that has just given the opening for this claim. Equally, it may be that there is more than one witness for the claimant and the claimant representative chooses to call another person first. If you are physically in the courtroom, sometimes the judge, even in a small claim, will ask the witness to take the witness box. Although, as I said, in small claims, the procedures are relaxed somewhat, so it's not necessarily a formal swearing in of the witness, but the judge will certainly expect that the witness is taken to their witness statement in the bundle of documents, confirms that the signature is theirs and that the contents of the witness statement are true and accurate. If you are not comfortable doing this, the judge will certainly help you to do that. And in many cases with unrepresented parties, the judge will do that 
automatically, where there is no barrister representing the party. Once the witness is ready and everybody has a copy of their witness statement, in civil cases, their witness statement is known as their evidence in chief. This is what you might expect from a witness giving live evidence in a criminal trial. The idea being in civil cases, to speed up the trial and save time, is that the written witness statement is taken as their primary evidence. Although you will have an opportunity, if it's necessary, to ask one or two additional questions just to clarify matters in addition to that witness statement. You do need permission of the judge, although the judge will usually ask you if there are any additional questions to that witness statement. But this shouldn't be a long and drawn out process because they should be limited to clarifying matters that are not clear in that witness statement. Once the claimant is satisfied that their first witness or indeed their own evidence is sufficient, the judge will invite the defendant or their representative to ask questions of the witness, or indeed the claimant, if it is a single claimant and witness. Now it's at this point that lots of people may be a little unsure as to what to do, because you are invited to ask questions of the opposing party's witness or witnesses. But of course if you are not a barrister or legally trained, you may not know how this works and how best to ask those questions to challenge the witness's evidence. That being the case, and if you are unrepresented and a little bit nervous, don't be afraid to ask the judge to assist you in asking these questions of the witness. What you could in fact do is tell the judge that you have certain questions but you don't know how to phrase them to the witness. The judge will then likely say to you, well why don't you tell me what it is that you would like to ask this witness or challenge this witness on, and then the judge will help you to put those questions to the witness. This is not to be confused with the judge taking sides with one party or another. One of the functions of the judge is to control the evidence that is presented to the court before making any findings. And in doing so, if the judge can understand the questions that you would like to put to this witness, the judge will have an idea as to what fact you are challenging and assist you in putting these questions to the witness, him or herself. This process of asking questions to challenge the witness's evidence is known as cross-examination, and you may have come across this term before. And there are essentially two objectives in this cross-examination. The first is to put your side of the story across to this witness and give them an opportunity to respond to it. And it's important to remember at this stage that the witness is not always likely to agree with you. In fact, quite the reverse. They are likely to disagree with you, because if you are putting your side of the case across to the witness, the likelihood is they will disagree with it, otherwise there wouldn't be a dispute in the first place. This is often referred to as putting your case. So either side is going to put their case to each other through the course of these cross-examinations. The second rather important function of a cross-examination is to look for inconsistencies in the evidence provided by the witness. That might be inconsistencies with fact, which is supported by some other document within the bundle, or sometimes even an inconsistency within the witness statement itself. For example, I have known cases where the defendant is said to have turned right at a particular junction, but somewhere in the witness statement they said that they clearly remembered turning left. This is quite a stark difference, but clearly it is an inconsistency. And whilst this might be readily explained away as a typographical error, there are other errors or inconsistencies that might be more contrasting and therefore call into doubt the reliability and perhaps credibility of that witness's evidence. Once all of the questions have been asked in cross-examination of this witness, then the party that called the witness will have the opportunity to re-examine that witness, but only on matters that arose out of the cross-examination, usually to clarify something that was called into question and perhaps wasn't quite clear. Again, at this stage, the judge may ask one or two questions to clarify matters arising out of the evidence. Once the judge and the parties are satisfied that the witness has completed their evidence, they will be excused from the witness box and the claimant will be asked to call their next witness, if indeed there is a second witness. And the process begins again. Once this process has been repeated with each of the claimant's witnesses, the judge will then move to the defendant party and ask them who is their first witness. The process will then be the same with the defendant witnesses, whether that be the defendant as a single party or the defendant and additional witnesses. Once all of the defendant witnesses have been called, the judge will again confirm whether that concludes the defendant's evidence. That being the case, once all witnesses have given evidence and been questioned, the judge will invite the defendant or the defendant's representative to make some closing arguments or a closing submission as to why the judge find in their favour. 
This will usually include any arguments as to law and references to the bundle of documents. But if you are unrepresented and you don't know the law, you don't need to worry too much because in these claims the judge is going to apply the relevant law to the set of facts in any event. Although even as an unrepresented party you are free to reference any law that you think is relevant to the judge and the judge will consider it and either apply it to the case or say that it is not relevant. Once the defendant or representative has concluded those submissions or closing statement to the judge, the judge will move back to the claimant for the final opportunity to make representations because it is their claim. And again, and in exactly the same way, the claimant will make closing submissions, statements or arguments as to why the judge find in their favor based on the facts, based on the evidence, based on the contents of the bundle, based on any relevant law, and even, and in many cases, arguments as to fairness, or what we call equity in a legal sense, as to why the judge should find in the claimant's favour. The claimant's closing statements will be the final step in presenting the case to the judge. Once the claimant has concluded this closing statement, the judge will usually move directly on to summing up the case and giving judgment. But in rare cases, usually when the court has run out of time, the judge may reserve the judgment to another date. This may seem frustrating because parties may have to come back at another date or recently hear it by telephone where the judge will conclude the case. Before giving judgment, you will hear the judge give a summary of the case, usually in quite a lot of detail, explaining why the claimant has brought the claim, what they say happened, and why the defendant has resisted the claim and what the defendant says happened instead. The judge will explain and explore various disputes of fact as he or she goes through the evidence and the submissions made by each party, and in doing so, on the crucial facts or issues or disputes within the claim, the judge will make what we call a finding of fact. This means that the judge will say that they've heard evidence from both parties, but you may often hear the judge say that he or she prefers the evidence of the claimant or prefers the evidence of the defendant. This is usually because the evidence is more consistent, more reliable, or more likely than not to be credible than the other party. Once the judge has explored all of the relevant facts and issues, and indeed applied the law to any of those facts that are relevant, the judge will then go on to say which party they find for in the claim and what amount of money the losing party should pay. There will then be discussions as to how long that party should be given to pay. It's usually 14 days or maybe 28 days. And then perhaps some discussion about costs. Although, as I said, in small claims, this is usually limited to fixed costs. That would be the fee to issue the claim in the first place and any hearing fees or perhaps application fees that have been paid along the way. In rare cases, when one party has conducted the litigation very badly, such as ignored court orders to provide evidence, the court may hear arguments as to other costs, such as the advocate's fee, if you've paid a barrister to attend court for you. And although this is relatively rare, it does happen, and I have been successful in arguing such costs, even in a small claim. Finally, once the judge has concluded the case, you can expect a copy of this judgment to be sent out to the address on record within a week or two. So I know that that sounds like a fairly complex procedure, but if you take it step by step and think about what the court wants to hear and at which stage, and by watching this video back again, you will come to understand the process that the court goes through to hear all of the relevant evidence and then make a finding of fact and find for one party or another as to whether the claim is successful or whether the claim should be dismissed. So in the meantime, please do leave me any questions and comments in the box below. And remember, stay humble and subscribe.